like to say down here in Lanesboro that we are deep in the driftless. And you just feel that when you're driving through the flat cornfields and all of a sudden you hit the hill coming down into town. My daughter will still say it today. She comes down the hill and says, Lanesboro, we're back. Driftless is a region where the glacier is missed, which means they slid around it and didn't carve it out flat like the rest of Minnesota and carve out all the lakes. So here it's natural bluffs, uh, everything's spring fed. So all the rivers and creeks stay super cold and it allows us to fish year round and they don't freeze. For trout, there's over 70 miles of floatable water. And on foot wading, there's more creeks and rivers to explore than I can in my lifetime. Um, a lot of them aren't even named and on the map. And just what you have on the map and named is, will take you your whole life to fish them all. So, um. <laughs> Pressure's off now. Trout fishing is the best in the state here. And one thing that's nice, I really hate to say, is that you know we have so much water that it's not crowded. Trout Unlimited and the DNR of Minnesota work with the landowners to buy easements from the property owners. That way, Anglers can have a place to walk along the river. Dave Schaefer, who works with me, contacts landowners and helps with Trout Unlimited and gets sponsors to help mow grass like this to make a nice trail like you see here. And that way you're not walking head high in wild parsnip, which will make your skin burn. As long as everybody's being respectful of the landowners property, we will continue to purchase these easements and give more stream access to everyone around Minnesota. Probably the first time I met Lance, he was standing out on the dock fishing. We grew up together on Lake Minnetonka, so a lot of our summers were spent fishing off the dock, swimming in the lake, just running around, being wild kids. Then years later, once we had both gone off to college, we kind of came back together and that was when we started dating. So we would travel and camp and fly fishing is just a natural extension of that. So of course we'd bring a fly rod and we both just realized we really enjoyed it. And then later, once our daughter and now our son were born, it's something that we really enjoy doing as a family. Actually, on a camping trip, probably about 2016, I would say, we drove through Lanesboro, and me and Lance saw the building for sale. We called up my dad right away and said, hey, crazy idea, there's a shop look, you could open your rod building shop and open a fly shop. And little did we know, he actually went and did it. I don't remember any hesitation along the way. He just saw the building, he knew it was perfect. It needed a lot of work, which scared off a lot of people, but he could see what it was gonna look like and he knew that it was going to be perfect for his shop. He moved down by himself and just worked away 14-hour days. He was sleeping on a cot in the apartment upstairs. But I just remember that first year or two coming down on the weekends and the excitement we would feel when we hit bluff country. We would 
be pulling up floors, knocking down walls, and every weekend we would be so amazed about the progress that was made. And in about six months, he had the shop ready to open. And I remember opening day, we were still figuring out the cash registers, we were still unboxing products, but we were open for the spring season and it was the start of a new chapter. This will take you right to the Greater Lake Superior Foundation website. It tells you more about coaster brook trout, regulations, historical abundance, more information on what they are. These signs were a collaborative effort between Scott Thorpe, the Greater Lake Superior Foundation, Minnesota Steelheader, uh, Minnesota Trout Unlimited, and the Minnesota DNR, uh, just to bring awareness to what coaster brook trout are and let all the thousands of tourists that come up here every year to the North Shore uh, know what a unique resource we have here, uh, that is Coaster Brook Trout. We are looking for some brook trout up on the north shore of Lake Superior, up above the boundaries, getting rigged up and go see if we can't get one. So uh, this is the above barrier. Typical of the above barrier populations is you know, these smaller, a little bit smaller size fish, average size fish, but we've been putting a lot of research into understanding the genetics of these fish. Over the last three years or so, we've been doing a, what we call the Coaster Genetics Project. And one thing we've been doing with the genetics work is trying to understand, you know, our, our coaster brook trout that get 20 plus inches and big and use Lake Superior, are they any different than, say, this little small brook trout that we caught here above above barriers. Our genetics research so far has shown that brook trout above the barriers really aren't any different than what is below. And it's one of those questions with coasters is what actually defines a coaster? Is it size? Is it uh, uh, the variability in the life history? Certainly it is, because uh, they do something different by using the big lake. But where do they come from? Where are they produced? And some of the genetics research has shown that there isn't a difference between what's up here and what we're catching here as small fish compared to what those 20 inches are below the barrier. And it just brings back the importance of like habitat in these above barrier reaches. So these brook trout are the coaster brook trout that are below. So we need to protect these streams to make sure that coaster populations remain as abundant or more abundant as they have been in the last hundred years. I'm trying to get it just a little, there, oh, I had one right there. A lot of times they'll hit it as soon as it hits or a couple seconds after and if they don't hit it I like to just kind of wiggle the rod and strip it back in.
coasters have undergone, I typically refer to them as they're the underdog of the Great Lakes. There's only two native fish to Lake Superior in, in terms of trout. It's coaster brook trout and lake trout. And all the rest of the salmon and brown trout have been introduced at some point. And a lot of those are introduced in the, in the early to late 1900s and they became established. So these brook trout have had to compete with a lot of other non-native fish. One of the other uh, cool fisheries up on the North Shore of Lake Superior is our steelhead population. Um, there's actually a, quite a few different species. We have steelhead, uh, brown trout, coho salmon, pink salmon, king salmon, on top of the migratory coaster brook trout. The steelhead spawn in the spring, so it's a, a good opportunity. It, it's a really popular thing. People come from all over um, catching the North Shore steelhead. And then in the fall, uh, we get runs of coho salmon, uh, pink salmon, and a few kings along with the coaster brook trout. Missed him the first time. I cast out and it jumped foot over the fly, so I cast again. And, wow, this nice little North Shore brook trout. Even before the 1900s, coaster brook trout populations were already seeing declines. Some of the historic journals and newspaper articles that we have from like the late 1800s and early 1900s has shown that as soon as development and roads start getting built up here on the North Shore, those coaster populations, those large fish below the barrier, their populations were depleted uh, rather rapidly. About at the same time, uh, we had a bunch of deforestation that was going on up here with a lot of timber harvest. Streams were actually utilized on the North Shore for log driving. And so some of these rivers, it's particularly the larger ones, they would clear cut the forest and throw the logs in the river, build a dam and then blow it out to push all the logs out into Lake Superior. So pretty fascinating to think about, you know, the, the history of the North Shore and in the grand scheme of things that, you know, our populations and particularly these brook trout have been really resilient in the face of everything that they've had to overcome over the last 100 plus years. Our goal moving forward is to, is to maintain or improve coaster brook trout populations below the barriers. Um, and what we're learning with our genetics research and, and stuff we've done over the last 10 years or more, um, it all leads back to we've got to protect these fish that are up here. Today we're going to hit a river in Minnesota and search of some smallmouth bass on the fly. Part of what makes this area so special is we've got a lot of water to explore here in Minnesota. We almost have 16 to 17,000 lakes. There's a great opportunity to get out and get fishing within 15 minutes where you live. There's a huge culture about big boats, walleye fishing. That's really kind of the religion up here. And what happens are the rivers, the trout creeks, everything like that gets a little overlooked. So I, I moved to Minnesota in, in 2008. Fishing was not on my mind. It was kind of in a fishing hiatus. Like most people, everybody's first introduction into fly fishing is, is pursuing trout. And we randomly went out with this guy, floated in the Mississippi once. I had no idea what I was doing. Just throwing some like black woolly buggers. And then you finally see that chase and that take. And you start to realize like, oh my God, this is here. Big fish are here and they're, they put on one hell of a fight. 
uh, and you get to do it in a drift boat and you're not in Montana. And I think it was that moment where it's like, should I get a boat? Should I get bass rods? Should I take this more serious? And the answer was yes. Growing up in Minnesota, I spent a lot of my summers with my family up in my grandparents' cabin and fishing off the dock with cousins. And really, I got that fishing itch pretty early. And for most people, their introduction to fishing starts with conventional tackle, bait casting rods, spinning rods. And I think that's important. You have to understand why you're triggering these fish, what's happening when you run crankbait you know, across a rock reef or, you know, what, why are the bass liking that? And then once you understand that and you can bring that over to fly fishing, there's that nice crossover where you understand, okay, conventional tackle is a tool and it works really well. Fly fishing is another tool and presentation. So you can bring that and use that to your advantage. So I grew up in Central Florida on the Gulf Coast around St. Petersburg. Uh, and when I was a kid, my dad decided to change careers from selling cars to pursuing his dream of owning a bait and tackle shop called the Happy Hook on Indian Rocks Beach. What I remember is getting there early in the morning when the bait trucks would show up and, and shrimp and minnows and just that smell of salt water and the appeal of that and being up early in the morning and going into the shop and looking at all the lure packaging and all the gear and just fantasizing about owning it all or using it all. Like that was, that was the stuff. Like that's the stuff that like sticks into your DNA. I've always grown up chasing smallmouth bass and really it's the fish that motivates me. It keeps me going through the winter when I'm shoveling my driveway. It drives you nuts. That's all I think about. We're right on the bank. Let me know if you want it a little tighter. There are times those really big fish, they're about efficiency and you know what meal can they have with spending the least amount of energy. So if they can take a popper or a streamer off a current seam from their ambush spot and just grab it without a lot of energy, sometimes it's deceiving. Like you'll get them to, to grab on the pause of a streamer take and all of a sudden you're like, something's different. So there's kind of those two worlds of being ready for an explosion at any minute, but also it's like, hey, if you know the light, the light looks different on the bank, what happened to my streamer? That can happen as well. So it's staying sharp throughout the day as an angler is uh, important. Looking at flies and you know what you tie and fish. If you come from the bait casting world, it's a little bit different perspective. They you know see it and it's like, okay, why don't you just put a big jig head on that or a couple of treble hooks and really what Phil's got is a basic fly and he's got this connection to it right and he's imparting all that action through his hands with the strips yeah it's in, uh, you know in the fly bin and it looks like that's basically a strike king soft plastic but what Phil's doing is making it dance and then the other side of it is you've got the conventional fly anglers that grew up with like parachute atoms and blue wing olives all that kind of stuff and it's like you put it out there and it is what it is, right? And you're like, if I can remove myself from it and just have a good, clean, soft drift, that's the presentation where this is a little bit different world that's like you're making that presentation happen by hand every time. And, and that's kind of the art of it that a lot of people take time to pick up in the, in the bass fishing world here. Thank you. 
That was a soft eat, huh, Phil? That was. Another quality fish, probably right at that 17-inch mark. Strong, healthy river smallie, though. Yeah. For me, the smallmouth bass is just the perfect formula of a good day. It's a fish that we're targeting, and it, it feels like we're streamer fishing, uh, you know, big browns out west. But also they they can be delicate fish like they'll come up and sip a hopper and it's just that variety through uh the summer months that keeps keeps me obsessing about it really nice healthy river smallie you get a whole lot bigger than that first fly shop to run a guided drift boat service down here in southeast Minnesota and we branched out now you can hit a uh, smallmouth, musky, pike, bass, largemouth bass, not only trout. So I'm growing and now we have a fleet of four boats that we can choose from with our guides and you know kind of really tailor any trip to make make your day worthwhile. People think of the Driftless as really tiny spring creeks. Um, and it's that's not really the case. There are a lot of rivers that are floatable that hold a lot of nice trout and smallmouth, so. Sweet. Part of Lanesboro is also that we're a very artistic town, which made it perfect for my dad because not only is this a fly shop, but he was an artisan fly rod builder, which is something we hope to continue as well. He was a finished carpenter, fine woodworker for 30 years. So combining that with his love of fly fishing it was kind of natural. He started in his basement at home on eBay, buying and selling old rods, fixing them up, refurbishing them. And then he got really interested in the history and it just turned into a full obsession for him. And he wanted to get as many of those rods through his hands back on the river fishing. He was outgrowing that office very quickly. And so when he saw the opportunity to retire from construction and open the fly shop and start building his custom rods. He knew immediately that was what he wanted to do.
in the fall of 2021, my dad, Steve Stobiniak, was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. It was very surprising. He was very healthy, active, and it had already metastasized um, throughout his body by the time it was discovered. So he received treatment up at the Mayo all through that winter, and he just fought that battle with so much courage and kindness and humility. It was harder on us than it was for him. He just kept his positive outlook and kept working hard every day. And hit that hard work is really what kept him going. And he was able to be here in the fly shop doing what he loved, building rods, right up until the end. We had about a year with him after diagnosis. We had all hoped that he would have much more time than that, but we had talked about what would happen with the fly shop. And, you know, me and Lance being such a part of it since the beginning really wanted to keep this tradition going and keep this business in our family. And so we decided that we would take it over when he passed away. We had our son in August of 2022, and about a month later, we took over the fly shop. We feel so grateful for his support and his trust in us in giving us this opportunity to continue the shop. And every day we're, we're living his mission of that hard work and kindness and humility. And we're here doing it. And we plan to be here for as long as we can be. trees they are singing to the tune of a song and the wind is gently ringing the bell that brings the morning the welcome of the dawn the voice of the robin the red leaves are falling, the barn owl is calling, the welcome of the dawn.